But for the sea, Venice could not be what she now is. The world's only major city to survive, intact and entire from the past. Being built on water has its problems. But without this all-pervasive water, there would be no Venice. Or if there were, she would be much like any other city of our time. The city of St. Mark, the world's only city without traffic. Just boats and people. Above all, people. At the edge of Venice is the Piazzale Roma. The traffic goes this far and no further. It has arrived by causeway from the mainland. Up to 10,000 vehicles crossing daily. Here it is parked, and from here the motorist embarks for the city. And so this place is a kind of frontier between the world as it was and as it is now coming to be. The motor vehicle, one of the great facts of our century. A boon to man. Why otherwise use it so insistently? Why otherwise devise so many shapes and sizes? Adapt to so many places and purposes? Surely no invention has been admitted to so close a partnership with mankind. Many skills have brought it to perfection. Many trials have raised it to a pitch of performance. Every year restyled, redesigned for greater comfort, retested for greater durability and safety. Most men covet it. It is the dream of most families to own one, or a better one, or a second one. Motoring offers freedom to anyone to go where he likes, when he likes. It is at once a means to reach places of recreation and a recreation in itself. It opens new horizons and richer experience to millions. It liberates and it educates. Engine, wheels, chassis. From these basic bones, a machine with which almost anyone can carry almost anything, almost anywhere. So adaptable that the machine itself can in its turn be carried almost anywhere by almost any means. Finally, as a maker of employment, it is incalculable. Using it, fueling it, servicing it, manufacturing it. Together, the largest industry in the world. No one is unaffected by its presence. Our commitment is total. It happened in America in the late 40s in Western Europe in the late 50s. The tide of traffic creeping up on us until it was higher than our capacity to cope with it. It is happening still. In other ways, we were advancing, but on the roads, we were slowing down, clogging up, losing ground. Some goods were costing more to move than to produce. Every year, 
more people with more money. More vehicles and more money to buy more vehicles. 30 million new vehicles a year. We were dazed. We painted lines and arrows. Created one-way streets. Invented zones and meters. But while we increased circulation, we did not decrease numbers. In due course, our improvements would be overtaken by traffic's inexorable growth. But behind the expedients and the stop gaps, in one field, remedy was at hand. Motorway, expressway, autobahn, autostrada, striding across valleys, punching through hills. The first great road rethink since Rome. These were not built in a day. They cost money. They cost land. But they worked. And with their spread, a solution to the main problems of cross-country driving was at last in sight. But motorways end. By speeding traffic on its way, we were speeding its pileup on arrival. For roads lead to cities, where most journeys start and finish, where most people live, and where most business is done. The ancient city, never planned for the motor vehicle, ill at ease with it, made for man, who walked to work. His speed and that of the horse governed its scale. The market and the church were its heart. And here, at the historic center, was to grow the great business concentration of our own day. The city of the past and of the present. The main difference is of size, of more people. But there was another factor essential to the transformation, transport. The city burst its ancient boundaries. Once there had been town and country. Now modern transport could give the best of both. Distance from work no longer mattered. The city spread thinner and wider. Suburbs 19th century style into suburbs 20th century style. The age of public transport and mass commuting had arrived. white-collar revolution, trading better homes for worse cities, better living for worse travelling. No wonder, as prosperity grew, that many would exchange public transport for the door-to-door -door comfort of the private car. door to door. Millions of cars to millions of doors. Commuter cars compounding the congestion of already stifled cities.
the parked vehicle, tyrant of the townscape, demanding 30 times the space of a standing person, reducing streets by half. Evening. The brimful city begins to spill outwards towards the suburbs. Commuter homewards. Pleasure seeker citywards. Tide and undertow. Current and countercurrent. Evening into night. The city, man's historic focus. Congested, chaotic, yet still magnetic, still beckoning its hinterland, still growing. Today, the ancient city has become the modern city, still not planned for traffic, still ill at ease with it. How much city to sacrifice to traffic? How much traffic to sacrifice to city? Meanwhile, man's noblest monuments rise over the roofs of vehicles. One way to preserve an environment is to exclude traffic, totally or partially. More and more cities are doing just this. But traffic is lifeblood. In practice, essential traffic would continue to be allowed. And everyone will tell you that his business is essential. So cities shrink from a general exclusion of the motor vehicle. But might there be another answer? The motorway had worked between cities. Why not within them? The scale is best seen at the interchanges. Four directions, eight changes of direction, with exits and entries, flyovers and underpasses. Small wonder the urban motorway is the big open question of the 1970s. The motorway comes to town. How many hundred houses will it cost? At whose head is the pistol pointed next? Beneath whose windows will the traffic next roar? Above whose roofs will the trucks next rumble? Roads are barriers. Big roads, big barriers. Slicing streets. Splitting communities. Separating housewives from shops, children from schools. But damage can be minimized by following existing lines of severance, like railways or canals. 
sighting below ground level reduces impact upon surroundings. Projecting parapets lessen noise and save space. Some urban motorways can be covered completely. Even a steep slope may be turned to advantage. Better still, trees, combined with broad banks. But this can be costliest of all, since a wide corridor must be purchased and landscaped. Urban motorway, mover of traffic, but also a tractor of it. So as the tide mounts, that which was built to relieve congestion becomes congested in its turn. The parked vehicle, greatest storage problem in world history. Since vehicles cover ground more valuable than themselves, we must think about stacking them. Above ground if we must, below ground if we can. Coordination above all. Parking plans in step with road plans. Buildings, roads, parking. Aspects of one problem. We have seen traffic as vehicles and structures. It is time we saw it as people. Two hundred thousand deaths a year on the world's roads. One every two minutes. If those killed could be buried in one place, this would be five days toll. assault upon the peace of all people's places, and traffic, the dominant source of noise in all towns. The ugliness of roads and dumps, sordid shoreline of our traffic's tide. proliferation of billboards, the multiplicity of signs and signals. The condition of our roads and streets, men and women, standing in the stink and din, urging more speed upon traffic which moves ever more slowly.
human conduct, the wear upon nerves, the constant corrosion of courtesy and kindness. The city street, once a balance between people and traffic in the service of both. Now a disservice to both. A place of conflict and pollution. A denial of civilized standards. Too many people to widen the roadway. Too much traffic to widen the sidewalk. Some older cities with no sidewalks at all. The man in the street, in the street, on sufferance. The new ethic that men and women, when not riding in powerful machines, are objects of slight regard. The future seems to lie in the segregation of traffic and people. The street becomes obsolete as our basic urban form. Streets without people, shopping precincts without traffic. Meanwhile, cars continue to sell, because we continue to want them. So much so that in America, numbers are expected to double in the next 30 years. In Europe, further from saturation, they may treble. Traffic demands we replan our cities but it also promises the revenue to do it. The question, how to get the best from the motor vehicle and escape the worst. Thank you, sir. Every country, every city, must seek its own solution. A world dazzled by the car, dazed by the scale of its usage. A world which has found a new way of walking, new feet on which to travel ever further and faster in the pursuit of happiness or business. A world reshaped for the motor vehicle, from which those who are neither drivers nor passengers have less to gain. A world which respects construction and the grand scale, but neglects compassion and the human scale. In the middle is man, for whose good all was invented. Ultimately, the choice is his. For this extraordinary machine, in some form, is with us for a long time to come. The motor vehicle demands that the world accommodate it. And the world must ask itself how much the motor vehicle is worth. Thank you.